the fish back to the web doc. Come on. Alrighty, let's go ahead and do uh, one more. And I'm thinking probably like every day we're going to have another uh, practice problem to work with here. Um, and this worksheet that I'm working from, I guess it is, it is in Canvas. Take a look at. Here and then here. Fix the focus. So should I have a non-zero formal charge on there? Nitrogen probably. Uh, what should the charge of nitrogen be? Positive one. Okay. So I'm going to use that as a starting point. So after um, we typically have arrows going towards positive charges or towards electronegative elements. So here we have a full positive nitrogen. I'm going to start off with doing that. And we'll see the result of that. So once again here, the basic structure remains the same. This NH2 now has a lone pair, giving it a zero formal charge. The carbon that used to have the double bond is now positive. Because now it only has three bonds to it. Okay. When you're uh, moving electrons around, you want to try to minimize the number of arrows you're doing at once. Because if you do too many arrows at once, you're going to skip important intermediates. So you want to try to do, I'd say, like one or two arrows at a time. Uh, three is kind of pushing it. And there are cases where you have to do more than two, but they're definitely the minority. So here, uh, what do you guys think I should do next? The, the middle double bond right, can move down. So I'm thinking this can move probably over here. And the result of that, so basic structure remains the same. I'm going to include this lone pair so we're keeping track of it. And double bond is now here. That one didn't move. And plus. Um, am I able to move this one? I don't think I can move that one. It's kind of stuck there. Um, any, any way that I move that, it's going to violate something. So if I were to push this over here, this would have to push over here, and that would violate the octet of nitrogen. So I think we're done with this one. We only have three, three total here. All right. So let's go ahead and make that table now of the formal charges. Uh, just so you guys become start becoming pro at this. So I think we'll say element over here. And then we're going to say uh, the, uh, this part here is going to be formal charges. So we'll say formal charge is zero. And then we'll take a look at plus one and minus one. And just make sure that's clear that's a zero there. All right, being that's organic chemistry, we'll start with carbon. So basically, uh, with, with carbon, you're going to have something with four bonds to it, right? So four bonds. The variations of this, so we have our tetrahedral. You can have your one that's trigonal planar. You could have the one that is linear. Like that, etc. All 
Um, there is one exception to this, and I don't really want to include it here. I'll put it on the board. This is the carbine. This is a really special case. Mark nothing at work. Uh, let's see if this one works. So the carbine is where we have something like that. Two single bonds and, a lo and one lone pair that have the formal charge of zero. Uh, these are extremely rare, though, and we're going to see later this semester they're highly reactive because they're not really happy in that situation. But technically, they have a formal charge of zero. All right, uh, next case here is a formal charge of plus one. Uh, most commonly, you're going to see where carbon only has three bonds to it, uh, conferring a plus one on there. And then for the case with the negative formal charge, this is the case where you have three bonds and a lone pair. That's the big difference there. You have the, if you have the lone pair there, it's negative. No lone pair, it's positive. And we like to call these uh, special names. Uh, the first one here is a carbocation. Just don't call it a carbocation, it's a carbocation. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, as you can probably guess, is a carb anion. And as we're going to see uh, later on this semester, these carb anions, uh, when they do exist, uh, they are some of the strongest bases known to man. They are highly reactive. So, and on that note, carb anions are not all that common. They're mostly common on doing resonance structure problems. All right, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the halogens. This is going to be a pretty short list. So X is for halogen. In this case, uh, to have a zero formal charge, what, what, what you're most likely going to see is a single bond and a lone pair. I believe the only time we see them as negative charges is when they are free ion. So when they're not bonded to carbon. And there is one point this semester where we're going to see them as a positive, And this is the case where it has two bonds to it. Like that. And if you wanted to, you could go back through all these examples and apply the formal charge equation. But I would rather you guys start focusing now on pattern recognition. All right. Uh, moving down the list here, the next one is H. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, most commonly, we're going to see this with a single bond to H is a zero formal charge. Um, typically, if it's plus, it means it's a free ion. Like that, and we like to call that a proton in this class. And the negative is when it's the free ion with a lone pair, like that. Does anybody remember what that one's called? The H minus, what was that? The hydride, yep. So hydrides, protons, etc. All right, moving down this list here. Let me uh, bring that up a little. Next, we have our nitrogen. Actually, let's do oxygen next. Oxygen, uh, typically if, oops, if oxygen is neutral, it has two bonds and two lone pairs. So we see that one that has like the bent geometry, and then there's the one we saw earlier today with the double bond O. Um, either case, they are still uh, two bonds, two lone pairs. A positive charge is where it has an extra bond. It has three bonds and one lone pair. Positive. And I believe the other example we saw today was where it was all together like that but they're pretty uh, similar. 
Either way, it's three bonds, one lone pair. All right, and then the last case here for a negative chart on an oxygen, that is where it bonds like a halogen. That's how I remember it personally. It looks like a halogen. And it has one bond, three lone pairs, negative one. And this could be uh, or sulfur. Remember, things that are in the same column of the periodic table have similar chemistry. So the same, uh, similar for sulfur. We are going to see some exceptions to that, but not too often. All right, uh, going down the chart here, we have nitrogen next. Nitrogen being a group five element is typically happy if it has three bonds and one lone pair, giving it a formal charge of zero. I want to draw some variations for you guys. So there's this variation. And then there's also the one where we have all three together like that. They're all formal charge of zero. A formal charge of plus one is where nitrogen has four bonds to it and no lone pairs. And you, if you want to look at some comparisons, we could actually just change out the lone pair from the previous ones to a bond, and that gives you the plus one charge. So that one's plus one. And I don't think we're going to see this one at all this semester, but that's another possibility for a plus one. All right, and then the last example here is nitrogen with two bonds and two lone pairs as a negative one. Another variation of that is where it looks like a car looks like the oxygen from earlier. This also has a negative. All right, the one last thing I want to add to this chart here is the group three elements we talked about earlier today. This was a boron or aluminum. They typically want to have three bonds to them. Like that. I don't think we're going to encounter one where they're positive. Actually. We will encounter this one though. So Braun being group three, three minus four is negative one. So here we go. And we're not gonna see that. All right. You think you can commit this to memory with enough practice? All right. Yeah, you definitely wanna focus on the uh, pattern recognition side of this all. It'll, it'll help you uh, save time in the long run. Mm. You guys need me to do more practice? Yes? Okay. Uh, actually, I have some different kind of practice here that I wanted to work on today also. Well, we can do some more resonance uh, practice as well today. We're actually just a little bit ahead for, uh, from what I was planning to be at today. So, we're making good time. Soon as I can find my notes here. All right, so uh, this example here is I want to go ahead and if you're given a formula, uh, come up with some structures. We did that a little bit last time, I believe. So the first one I want to take a look at is, let's say, C3, H6, Br2. I believe all the examples we did last time are all just C's and H's. So here I want to go ahead and include some heteroatoms. Do you guys remember what the word heteroatom means? Non yeah, non-carbon or hydrogen. We use the word heteroatom for that. Different atom. Okay, so if I'm asking you guys to draw the Lewis structure, all the different uh, isomers of this, what should you start off with? 
Well, was there a calculation we started off with? There was an ISD calculation. So uh, if you guys don't remember what ISD was, this was 2C plus 2 minus hydrogens and halogens. Let me add for nitrogen. And then all of that divided by 2. So then if we're calculating that for this compound, what do we get? So we have 2 times 3 plus 2. So this, uh, so the first number here that you're calculating, that's how many H's you should have for the corresponding straight chain fully saturated alkane for that many carbons. So it's going to be 0. So then you, And then you subtract off what you actually have. So we actually have 6 plus 2. You treat the halogens as if they're hydrogen because they bond in the same fashion. And then we're dividing by two. This is overall zero. So what that tells me is that whatever structure I draw here, I cannot have any rings or double bonds. So everything can be straight chain. So I think there's only one, really one possible way to draw the carbon structure like that. And I think the main thing that's going to change here is where we put the bromines at. So it doesn't really matter where you start. You know, just start somewhere. So I'm going to start with putting them both on the first carbon. And then we can just kind of move from there. So I could, th I could then put them both on the second carbon like this. So remember, as long as you're satisfying the criteria of the IHD, your structure will always have the correct number of H's in it. So you don't have to go back and count all the H's by hand. As long as you're uh, satisfying IHD, meaning you have no rings or double bonds here. Um, should I try the next, should the next one be where I put them both on the third carbon? Nope. That'd be the repeat, right? The repeat of the first one. So I think the best way would be to start breaking them up now. <laughs> so... I believe one combination is where I put them at carbons one and two. Um, any other combination you guys think of? What's that? A one and three. So if I put it two and three, that would be a repeat of this one. But if I put it one and three, we now have a unique structure. And I think that's it can't think of another one offhand. All right, uh, let's go ahead and try another one. Uh, remember when you're doing this kind of problems that there is no set uh, algorithm to figure out exactly how many are possible. You kind of just got to go with it until you, until you start getting uh, repeats of everything. And my general rule is when you think you got all of them, you're, you're forgetting one of them. That's what I always go with. I always say I'm forgetting one of them if I think I have them all. So just if you, as long as you operate with that mentality, you might might be able to get them all. All right. So next one I want to do here is I don't know C five H ten O. Showing up, there we go. C5H10O. The so first things first, we need to calculate an IHD equal to one. Yep, IHD of one. So that tells me that uh, no matter what structure I come up with, I have to have a ring or a double bond. So it's not and a double bond because then you have an IHD of two, right? So to make sure that you're keeping to your IHD, only one ring or double bond, have exactly five carbons, exactly one oxygen, you'll have the correct number of hydrogens then. So there really is no best way to start. Just start somewhere. So here I'm going to start with an OH. And I can start moving this around. So I'm going to move the OH to carbon number two. 
I'm kind of doing it backwards from what the last one looked, but it's still technically the same thing. Now to carbon three. And then if I go to the next carbon, I'm basically repeating this one, right? If I put it to this one, that's a repeat of the structure here. So I think what I can do now is start moving carbons around. So one, two, three, four. I'm gonna move a carbon to there. I can move a carbon to here. And one, two. What do you guys think about that last one? Is that a unique structure? No. 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 I actually repeated this one. These two are the same structure. So be careful of that. I think it's fine to write them out as you're doing it, just to recognize a repeat, but just to try to get rid of those in your final answer. Go ahead. Is there anything wrong with this? Yeah. Oh, you're good. So, yeah. So, my IHD isn't right, is it? So, you can recognize here that I have too many hydrogens. So, how can I fix this? Double bond somewhere. Yep. So, double bond, double bond, uh, double bond, double bond, double bond. Now we're good. So, you can imagine here all the different possibilities that I could have here. There's a lot of possibilities. Um, I do want to go through a few more here just to show you the kind of things you want to think about. Um, one thing you want to try to avoid is you want to try to avoid a double bond and an OH on the same carbon. And this is what's called an enol. And you want to avoid these. And the reason uh, we're going to go over it in a lot of detail next semester, but it turns out that these things don't, do not stay in that form. They immediately become something else. Um, some other things you can do here is uh, five carbons. We could do a double bond to O like we had earlier in some of our examples. And we could move this thing around, et cetera, et cetera. And then moving the carbons around. And the other uh, possibility for IHD is a ring. So we could have something like that, or we could have, wait, that's not enough carbons, is it? Nope. Like that. And remember, if you have a ring and a double bond, your hydrogen counts wrong, because then your IHD is wrong. So try to avoid that. And I'm thinking this one alone would probably be, I'm guessing about 20, maybe, 20 to 30 uh, different possibilities. So, like I said last time, I will specify the amount I want. And I typically like to go like between the 5 and 8 range, typically, for the kind of questions I ask on a test. All right, any questions about the isomer drawing? Okay. All right, I think I want to just do uh, one last little thing here and then we'll switch over to doing a little bit more practice. Switch over to the desktop. And bring this up. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, different types of isomers. Um, if you look, actually look ahead in, in the lab, we actually do a stereochemistry lab, and isomers actually explain in full detail in that lab. I believe it's like lab six. But anyway, um, what I want you guys to know here is the different types of isomers. Um, we're only going to work with the first type uh, during the first exam content, and the conformational and the stereoisomer one will be next exam. And I want you guys to be able to recognize what they are for now. So the first type here is constitutional. That's the type we've been working with where the connectivity is changing. And then uh, the next type is uh, conformational, 
that is where we have bond rotations. So for example, uh, drawing a butane or a four carbon chain like this and drawing it like this. These are technically the same compounds. They're not constitutional isomers, but we did twist the bond a little bit. So that is a conformational isomer. And we're going to go over this in excruciating detail uh, next, next exam content. And then the last case here is stereoisomer. Uh, this is the case where they, uh, they're only differing by uh, how they are in three-dimensional space. So for example, we have an eraser here, I think so, or not. So if we have a compound, say, that's like this, and then I put a wedge dash here, like so. Um, if I were to redraw this and flip the orientation of the wedge and the dash, they are no longer the same compound. So those are a, a, effectively a left hand and a right hand of a molecule. They are not the same. And as we'll see uh, in this chapter, uh, it's basically, um, if you guys have ever tried to put your right hand into a left-handed glove, it doesn't fit. And the same kind of thing happens in nature all the time as well. And the biggest impact that you guys are probably going to hear about, for me anyway, is how this has an effect on pharmaceuticals. Uh, you guys have probably heard about like there's you know side effects a lot of the times. Uh, many times the side effects are coming from the wrong hand that you're getting in your drug, and it's actually really hard to separate these two. So it's actually ma uh, mandated by the FDA that they uh, drugs are currently 99% pure in one hand or the other, but sometimes a little bit of the other one gets over there, and that's where your a lot of your side effects come from, um, and a lot of times. But we'll go over that in a lot more detail then. All right, but that's actually the end of this content here. Um, I believe next time we're going to go ahead and move into infrared spectroscopy. So if you guys want to read ahead, I want to start, start into infrared spectroscopy next time. But um, for today, I want to go ahead and just do a couple more practice problems, and then that's we'll, we'll end today. Let's switch back to the doc. Mm. I had some examples. Yeah, let's go ahead and do, do another resonance structure problem. I think we have plenty to work on this week, huh? I know it's a lot. Uh, did anybody purchase the uh, David Klein Oh, Time of the Second Language book, the little workbook? I highly recommend that book. I can't recommend it enough. It's, it's excellent. So if, if you could, uh, I believe we're doing the first and second chapters out of that book right now. Um, if you're following in a standard textbook, like the one for the course, the official textbook for the course, I believe we're still in chapter one. All right, so here we have this. And I want to include all my lone pairs just so I have an idea what can move around. Oh, sorry. I'm like seeing it on my screen here, but not there. That's showing up better? All right. So what do you guys think? Uh, where is a good place to start? The double bond here? Um, if I if I move over this way, we're going to violate the octet rule of nitrogen. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we can't really go this way right away. Because I think the best place to start would be to move this right here. And I'm seeing that similar to the C double bond O that we saw earlier. So that's usually usually a good starting point. Uh, carbon with multiple bonds to a hetero atom. Good place to start. So I move that way. So why am I having the arrow goes toward nitrogen, not towards carbon? Okay. Yep, nitrogen is more or less negative than carbon is. So it's going to go in the direction where it's more or less negative. So the base structure stays the same. Carbon, double bond N, 
This nitrogen now has two lone pairs on it. Now I, now I need to think about uh, non-zero formal charges. So where is the positive charge? So carbon gets the positive charge. The way you keep that straight in your head is things that have lost electrons become positive, things that gain electrons become negative. So this is going to become negative. Um, you could draw another resonance structure where I show another bond breaking. And actually, let me uh, go ahead and draw that, but I want to explain why it's wrong. So what I mean by that is doing the same arrow push again. Uh, you don't want to do this. And you could draw the resonance structure results to see why. So if I were to do the same arrow push again, that's what I would end up with. And the problem with this is now look at the charges. We have a plus two and a minus two. Those, anything with a uh, you know, greater than plus one or minus one, anything higher than that are high energy structures. You want to avoid them. So that is a bad resonance structure. So I think a better place to go with this, so first thing I want to put a big red X through that. A better place to go with this, I think, would be to move the other double bond. So I'm going to move this over here. All right, so H2N. We have a positive here now. Get that. All right. And I believe I can get one more structure. Yep, so lone pair of nitrogen moves towards the positive charge. So this is going to drop down like that. Be careful. You want, you want to do the double-headed arrows, and you want to use the resonance arrows. So do not use the equilibrium arrow here. They're not the same. Okay. And... Don't forget about the formal charges, should end up like so. You got a positive on the left nitrogen and a negative on the right nitrogen. But overall, if you look at each individual resonance structure, the total is zero every single time. That way you're making sure you're maintaining your consistency with the formal charges. Um. I want to do another one. So this is acetophenone. Just camera there. There we go. All right, let's take a look at acetophenone. Um, one thing we're going to see with the, the benzene compound, if you want to get one guaranteed resonance structure, is you flip the orientation on the ring. So what I mean by that is you're going to have a full, like, three arrows in here. And it's going to flip the orientation of the ring. That is definitely a correct resonance structure. Is that... Uh, the thing is, though, that by doing it that way, you're kind of uh, skipping a lot of the detail in the middle. So I recommend uh, starting off this one the same way we did the other ones, where uh, we have a hetero atom to work with. So that's almost always a, a good place to start. So I'm going to start off with that. So then we see the result of this. So here we have the negative here, positive here. Like so. And then just like what we had in the previous example, 
Like if you're looking back up here, we kind of have the same sort of situation. Oops. The situation happening right here, don't we? It's all about pattern recognition, guys. You're going to see the same kind of arrow pushes all the time here. So what I'm going to do next is go ahead and bring this up like so. And you guys have become really good at drawing hexagons, right? Not the joke from last time. Really good at drawing these hexagons. All right, for the sake of time here, I'm going to drop off the uh, implied lone pairs, but because I'm seeing a negative charge there, I know there should be three there. And then filling in the rest of the double bonds. Uh, this carbon had lost its electrons. It's now positive. And you're essentially going to continue this around the ring. And we're, we're eventually going to get back to our starting point. I believe it's going to be maybe three or so more resonance structures that we get back to our starting point. All right, so we have this. And we are making sure that we are staying overall the same formal charge. It's overall neutral. All right, and we're chasing the positive. Another thing I like to think about, we're always chasing that positive if you have all these double bonds to work with. So positive is now there. All right, we're moving along here. So now I can bring this back here. And notice what it's going to do. It's going to bring us uh, back to where our bending looks like that, doesn't it? Like, they're, like the one I started with. All right, so let me just bring this down just a tad. All right. All right, we got our benzene ring back. Not quite done yet. We are now at that resonant structure. And then the last resonant structure, we could just bring this back down and we are back to the starting point. Uh, the reason why this is important is because, so going back to my original discussion here at the start, where if we just flipped the double bonds around, we skipped all this detail by doing that. So if you did, if you just did the first arrow push up top here, you're missing all that detail in the middle. So if you're drawing the resonance hybrid for this, you need to include all the resonance structures. So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and draw the resonance hybrid. Uh, the resonance hybrid is where we draw everything that haven't moved. And then we use dotted lines to represent where double bonds may be at. So double bond may be there, here, or around this ring. Also, additionally, from the resonance structures, I see that at certain points, I might have an, a full negative on oxygen there. And then at other times, I may have po positives here, I may have a positive here, here, or here. And this matters because next semester we're going to see that when we do a reaction with these, the atom that ended up with a delta positive act differently than the one that didn't get that. So all this detail in the middle does actually matter. So just get in the habit of doing structures correctly. That way it won't be a problem later on where it actually starts to matter. All right, and I think you guys have a lot to work on over the next couple of days, pretty much till the end of the semester, really, right? So uh, go ahead, you got a question? Uh, so the resonance hybrid drawings, um, they won't include like lone pairs or anything? Um, I typically drop off the lone pairs just for the sake of uh, convenience. Mm -hmm. uh, you could leave them in there. If you were to leave them in there, I would just leave two lone pairs on this oxygen here because you, at any given point, you have at least two on there. Uh, so basically what, what you want to show is your base structure is what's not moving, mm -hmm. and then the dashed lines or, or dots for what, what is moving. Okay. Any other questions?
All right, don't forget, I have office hours. None of you guys have been coming, really. I do them. I actually had a big block today from 10 to 12. And I'm also going to be sitting in Discord uh, during office hours also. So if you can't make it in, just pop in the Discord. I'll be in the chat. Um, if you're having trouble figuring out how to use Discord, you're always welcome to stop by and I can give you a little tutorial on how to do it. All right, and I'll see you guys on Thursday. 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 Thursday.